Good morning, everyone. Did you enjoy yesterday? It was a great port. Beautiful. Turned out to be a beautiful day. So this morning I want to talk about Captain James Cook and uh, the age of exploration. James Cook was an English farm boy who dreamed of going farther than any man had ever gone, and he did. And just to put this in a little historical perspective, um, the Renaissance is that period, 14th, 15th centuries, uh, following the bubonic plague. And that was when people began, instead of looking off to the world and the future and the world hereafter, they began to focus on the here and now. And uh, they became interested in the world around them. They became interested in reawakened interest in uh, antiquities, in, in mathematics, and in the classical world. And that led to the age of uh, European discovery, which was the 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, that's when people searched uh, for new paths to the Far East and discovered along the way new worlds, um, new worlds to them. And then following on on that, you have what has called, been called the Age of European Exploration. That's the 18th and the 19th centuries, when people really began to try and explore the world around them and see what was here. And no one really personifies that better than Captain James Cook, who really set the pattern for exploration that still survives even to this day, even as we dream about going uh, to Mars. So Cook made three amazing voyages. He explored areas of the world that were previously unknown to Europeans. And uh, Cook was really an unlikely prospect uh, to change the world. He was one of eight children of a Scottish farm worker in Yorkshire. His father's employer recognized the spark of something in this kid. And so he paid for the boy to go to school. After five years of school, his father had been made a farm manager, and Cook began working on the farm for his father. Now, his parents' home, and this is interesting, this is not Cook's home, by the way, but it's where Cook probably only visited as an adult and went home to visit his folks, but it's called Cook's home because of that. That has been moved from England to Melbourne and is a big tourist attraction. Talk about straining for a tourist attraction, man. It's not as great, I admit, as the train tunnel in Gaiman. How many of you went up and saw the train tunnel? Wasn't that a marvelous... That's all? Oh, a couple of you. Yeah, it was really great. You, you walked up there and they took you out and showed you a train tunnel. <laughs> it was amazing. But anyhow, whatever. So this is actually... The place in Melbourne is actually... Uh, where his parents lived, and Cook probably visited there at least once. But at 16, uh, Cook left home. He began working as a shop boy. He moved to the port town of Whitby, where he met friends of the store owner who owned uh, ship, your, ship owners, and uh, these were ships working the coal trade. So uh, young Cook joined the merchant navy as an apprentice, um, on his own, in his own time, he studied math, algebra, trigonometry, astronomy, and navigation. And eventually he worked his way up to becoming a mate. A mate was the person in charge of navigation, somewhat like our first officer today. And the cook was offered command of his own merchant ship, but instead of that, he chose to volunteer for the Royal Navy. Uh, he started right at the bottom, as a master's mate, like our petty officer. And then he worked his way all the way up through the ranks all over again. He rose quickly to master, which would be like uh, our staff captain today, and served in the Seven Years' War. He became a master surveyor, produced the first accurate maps of Newfoundland, which brought him to the attention of the British Admiralty and the Royal Society. And about this time, uh, Cook declared, I intend to go not only farther than any man has gone before me, but as far as I think it is possible for a man to go. Now, by way of background to this whole story, you have to understand something that was called the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. 
This was charter chartered by King Charles in 1660. It was intended to be a place for research and discussion. Uh, initially, the Royal Society had no rules, no methods. The primary goals were to organize and view experiments and share knowledge and discoveries and discuss these. But it soon became a very political outfit, as political as the church or any university eventually becomes. And the other thing you need to know in this story is about the transit of Venus. Now, following Copernicus, people have always been fascinated with the relationship of bodies in the solar system, the distances of planets from Earth and from each other and from the sun, and the whole size of the solar system. And one of the ways of calculating this was to observe a solar phenomenon known as the transit of Venus. And you would look at this transit from different places on the Earth's surface, and by making the calculations, you could come up with some ideas of distances. By making precise observations of the slight difference in the time of either the start or the end of the transit from widely separate points on the Earth's surface, you could calculate each planet's relative distance from the Sun. The transit of Venus is really very similar to a solar eclipse by the Moon, but because Venus is so much further away, it appears smaller than the Moon in an eclipse. So that the transit of Venus, this is actually the shadow of Venus on the Sun, very tiny, tiny dot. Using the principle of parallax, scientists calculate the distance between the Sun and the Earth. And records of these observations can be found already in Babylonian tablets from 800 BC. They were developed again by William Crabtree in 1639. So it's during the transit of Venus that Venus looks like this tiny, small, black disk moving across the face of the sun. It usually lasts only a few hours, and it is one of the rarest predictable astronomical phenomena that occurs once every 243 years. So pairs of transits occur eight years apart. They're separated by these long gaps of about 121 years or 105 years. The last pair of transits were in 1874 and 1882. The first pair of transits took place most recently in 2004, and the next one in that pair will be in 2017, next year. And after that, if you miss that one, the next one will be in 2125. So book your cruise now for next year or wait till 2125 to see it. So Cook had come to the attention of both the Admiralty and the Royal Society, and he was asked to lead an expedition to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus. He was given considerable leeway in outfitting a ship. The ship he chose was the Earl of Pembroke. It was refitted, renamed the Endeavor. And Cook crossed the Atlantic. He rounded the horn just like we did and headed off to Tahiti. And he sailed to Tahiti. He anchored off what is today called Point Venus, intending to observe this phenomena. Now, if you go to Point Venus today, there's a light tower there. Uh, the light tower came many, many years after Cook was there. And there is this really beaten up monument. And the park as a whole is dirty. It's unkempt. It's a place where tourist buses go and homeless people live. It's very, very disappointing, folks. But although Cook and his astronomer had great weather, and they actually saw the transit, what impressed them in Tahiti was not the transit of Venus, but the women. Now remember, they had been months at sea, so they were ready to see the women when they got to Tahiti. So the results of this scientific experiment were actually somewhat disappointing. And once the Endeavour had sailed from Tahiti, Cook, as had been ordered, he opened sealed orders from the British Admiralty. And the orders were that he was to continue his voyage. Apparently, the transit of Venus observation was somewhat of a cover for the real purpose of his voyage, 
which was to explore and discover territory for England, specifically what we know as New Zealand and Australia. So Cook made amazingly accurate charts of the area, charts that remained in use for decades. This is his chart of uh, New Zealand. Um, so mission completed. Uh, Cook returns to England, having circumnavigated the globe. He goes back home to England. Now on that voyage was a young botanist whose name was Joseph Banks. Uh, history tells us that Banks was a grower of luxuriant cannabis plants. Mm -hmm. And Cook's, Cook, when he gets back, discovers that his journals are published without his permission, but uh, Cook becomes a hero in scientific circles. But us and People magazines we're more fascinated by Joseph Banks, the botanist who grew the cannabis and accompanied Cook, than they were by Cook himself. But that was fine with, with Cook. Cook was not interested in, in being the celebrity. So Banks became a minor celebrity. Unfortunately for Cook, uh, Banks became so popular with the Royal Society that Cook was forced to take him on the second trip, <clears throat> during which Cook was supposed to voyage into the Arctic Circle. It was 1772. The resolution was be in the yard being re-outfitted for this new voyage. Banks, who pretty much controlled the Royal Society side of things, had a large high castle built on the aft of the ship to accommodate him and his entourage, including two liveried musicians, court dandies, and even an American mistress who was dressed as a man since women were not allowed on board. Cook and his officers complained to the Admiralty that the castle made the resolution ugly and unseaworthy. It was feared that the ship would be top-heavy and roll over in rough seas. I'm sorry, folks, but uh, I just couldn't resist. This is what I consider one of the ugliest ships ever built. <laughs> and it just reminds me of the problem that Cook was facing. Well, Cook and his officers complained to the Admiralty uh, that the castle made the resolution unseaworthy, and it was feared that the ship would be top-heavy, roll over in rough seas. So the Admiralty ordered it removed. Then Banks refused to sail, which was fine with Cook. So Cook is promoted to commander. He's commissioned by the Royal Society to search for the mythical Terra Australis, believed to be a larger landmass south of New Zealand, which is what we t today know as, as Antarctica. And he sets forth on the resolution. He's accompanied by another ship called the Adventure. And this is the second voyage of, of James Cook. Uh, this is a picture of the resolution and the adventure in Matave Bay. And this is a picture of the Don Princess in Matave Bay. Now, folks, if you haven't done this, you need to talk to the cruise consultant on board. People a lot of times ask me what the most uh, beautiful place I've ever been in the world is, and I always answer Boquete in Panama because I live there, and that's true. But Morea, for me, would be a close second. And when we sail in there, it is just, just spectacular. And this is Cook's Bay, and that's another R-class ship, uh, one of the seven sisters that include ocean and Pacific in, in the bay and Cook's Bay. And uh, Morea is just fantastic, fantastic. Well, Cook was a very fair commander, and he treated the local indigenous people and their leaders and chiefs with the utmost respect. And crew who didn't follow his example were harshly treated, even being flogged right in front of the natives that they had abused. Now, one of the fascinating places that Princess goes is to Easter Island. How many of you have been to Easter Island? Okay, the rest of you need to go, believe me. Uh, Cook's visit uh, followed that of Jacob uh, Rogovin, a Dutch explorer who was also sent out to find what they called Terra Australis. Again, not what we know as 
Australia, but Antarctica. Anyhow, Roggeveen stumbled on Easter Island in 1772. It's, it's not a, a happy encounter. Roggeveen ended up firing on the natives, killing several of them. But he did note these amazing standing statues. Emphasis on standing statues. 52 years later, when Cook visits Easter Island, he notes that a number of the statues have been toppled. Very significant. 1825, another British ship, the HMS Blossom, stops at Easter Island and reports that there are no standing statues. Now, what happened? Why? Well, it appears that a new cult replaced the cult of the ancestors, and the new cult was known as the cult of the birdmen, illustrated in this carving in the stone. Uh, and it's a fascinating, fascinating story. And if you haven't been to Easter Island, you can work that into an itinerary sometime. It really is a place to go to. Uh, maybe if we have time, I'll try and throw in uh, my lecture about Easter Island and about the Birdmen. But it's a, it's a fascinating story and, and really neat. So uh, several times Cook uh, took natives on board to sail with him to learn from them about local navigation. They weren't strictly pilot, pilots like we bring on board, but there were local people who understood uh, how to navigate in the area. And he also used them uh, sometimes as translators. The most famous of these was a young Polynesian named Mai who was taken on board the adventure. Uh, somehow in the storms of the Pacific, the two ships got separated. The two ships, the resolution and the adventure, they missed a, a scheduled rendezvous uh, they couldn't just radio each other, or text, or email back and forth. So <coughs> Cook went on. They, they missed the rendezvous. He, they hoped that the adventure was still afloat, but nobody knew for sure. It was very possible that it had been lost because it didn't show up. Unknown to Cook, the adventure had actually turned around, set sail for home on the 22nd of December, 1773, going back around Cape Horn, returning to England on the 14th of July, 1774. Cook and the adventure, uh, or uh, the adventure, get Cook and the adventure get back to England about a week later, a week after the adventure, and they discover that by this time, Mai, the young Polynesian of the adventure was the hit of London society. Mime, who was mistakenly called Omai oh in Britain, was the first Pacific Islander to visit Europe. He joined the adventure in 1773. He traveled to Europe, became a favorite of Joseph Banks. Remember our guy Joseph Banks? Okay. And he became the hit of London society. He was known as the noble savage, and when presented to, at court to the king and queen, he said, How do, King Tosh? <laughs> uh, the king actually took Omai into the streets uh, of London to meet Omai's, not the king's, adoring fans. And Omai collected tons of gifts and stuff from fans, he, outfits, furnishings, animals, weapons, even a full se set of medieval armor and all of which he intended to take back home. So bringing Omai to Europe was not Cook's idea, but it was the idea of the captain of the adventure. Although Cook had not favored taking Omai to Europe, he was mildly amused by all these going-ons, but he pretty much ignored Omai and all the fuss. On that second voyage, Cook became the first to cross the Antarctic Circle in 1773, he almost me reached the mainland of Antarctica. Uh, now, one of the problems in those days was calculating longitude was seemingly an unsolvable problem because you needed a clock to do the calculations. And at that time, all the clocks were driven by pendulums, which you couldn't work or use on a ship, especially a sailing ship that was healing over half the time, the pendulum just wouldn't work. So all that changed with the invention of the marine chronometer. Cook was able to test the chronometer on his second voyage for the first time. And he returned full of praise for the watch. Uh, the charts of the Southern Pacific he made were so accurate that they were still in use up until mid-20th century. 
Now, interesting that the cost of the first chronometers were about 30% of the cost of the entire ship. They were extremely valuable, but they were extremely useful. Well, Cook returned after the second voyage. He was given the rank of captain, honorary retirement from the Royal Navy. He was made a fellow of the Royal Academy, and he was given a desk job as an officer of the Greenwich Hospital for seamen. But Cook quickly discovered that he wasn't cut out for a desk job, wasn't cut out for retirement. 1776, he set out once again on the resolution with the discovery, another ship, and the purpose of the voyage was to look for a Northwest Passage. Had England been able to find the fabled Northwest Passage, it would have more than made up for the problems that England was having in the colonies in 1776 and would have been an international coup for the British. But there were all kinds of delays getting started on this voyage, including the fact that the king insisted on Cook taking along a whole barnyard full of farm animals. To obscure the real reason for the voyage, which was to look for the Northwest Passage, taking Omai home was used as a cover story, and Omai's departure provided more than enough diversion from the real purpose of the voyage. When they were finally able to offload Omai, Somewhat comically, Omai insisted on returning home on a gift horse, wearing a suit of medieval armor, and firing off a gift pistol as he came off the ship, which of course sent the folks from home, the welcoming party of countrymen, running off into the bushes. And from then on, pretty much nothing went according to plan. On this voyage, uh, Cook's personality seemed to have changed. Where in the past his interaction with natives had been peaceful, respectful, now there was constant conflict with Cook acting very much out of character with cruel responses to native theft. Cook landed in Kauai, then sailed, it up, sailed up the western coast of California, up the inside passage into the St. Lawrence, into the Bering Strait, only to be forced back by the ice. The route prior to Cook's death is shown in red. The route of his crew following his death is shown in blue. So you can see, he went all up along the western coast of the U.S., got almost up there looking for this Northwest Passage, which when we get talking about the Panama Canal, I'll talk about it because it's fascinating even to this day. But uh, uh, that, that's what they were, were, they were looking for. So unable to continue his search for the Northwest Passage because of the ice, uh, Cook decided to go back to Hawaii. Not a bad decision, actually. Um, and he decided he would explore the Hawaiian Islands and then return to North America in the spring. When Cook arrived in Hawaii, he was stunned by the reception that he received because the harbor was filled with boats of every size and people celebrating. He was welcomed in Hawaii, entertained. His ships were lavishly provisioned, and Cook was treated as if he were a god. Now, unbeknownst to Cook, the Hawaiians had a god named Oron Orono Makuk Makua, who was the god of Hawaii's season of abundance. The tradition was that or Orono would return to the island from the north in a great canoe, and he was to be greeted by islanders with white banners. So the return of Orono, Orono would, be, would bring great abundance. That's what they believed. And by coincidence, Cook had come from the same direction and by the same route known as the path of the gods where they expected this god to return, and he'd anchored overnight in front of the Morai, just as predicted in the religious tradition. So Cook is treated in his mind as a conquering hero. In the Hawaiians' minds, he's treated as a returning god. The Hawaiians load him down with gifts and supplies. He's feeded in innumerable feasts and ceremonies all across the island, but waiting for spring to return to North America, uh, Cook was as keen to get away 
as the islands were uh, the islanders were getting anxious for Orono or 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 to return to his heavenly home. They had given and given and given, and, and still th they were there. And uh, so everybody was getting, this was the guest who had stayed too long. And there were misunderstandings as Cook prepared to sail. But finally on February 4th, he got underway. He leaves the Hawaiian Islands. The god is gone. Almost immediately, Cook hits a severe storm. February 8th, the foremast split, and Cook has to return back to Hawaii. The reappearance of the god from the wrong direction was not in the religious tradition. And almost immediately, there were problems with theft. Cook's return caused not only second thoughts amongst the Hawaiians regarding their prior generosity to the man who they thought was a god, but Cook's return was clearly unwelcomed. There were thefts, skirmishes, angry sailors, equally angry natives. And in one of these skirmishes along the rocks of the bay, the situation escalates. The Marines from the Endeavor open fire. In the ensuing fighting, Cook is clubbed over the head. He's stabbed repeatedly, and he's killed. And the Marines were forced to withdraw, leaving Cook's body among the rocks. When they returned the next day, the body was gone. They discovered from a still friendly chief that the body of Cook had been cut and quartered and distributed across the island to powerful chiefs. The esteem in which Cook was nevertheless held by the Hawaiians resulted in his body being retained by these chiefs. And Cook's body was to be, be preserved as was customary for the highest elders, and his bones were to be preserved as icons similar to what the Europeans had been doing all along in the treatment of saints in the Middle Ages. Well, with the help of a few still friendly chiefs, they were able to return, retrieve chunks of much of Cook's body, some of it partially cooked, and to give Cook a decent burial at sea. And in Hawaii, uh, the tour boats still point out the Cook Memorial on the spot of his death, February 14th, 1779. His men continued on, and uh, the route prior to Cook's death is shown in red, uh, and the route of his crew following his death is shown in blue. If you'd like to read more about Cook, this is really a, a good biography. Uh, Captain James, James Cook by Richard Howe. It, it's really a fascinating read, and this is a fascinating man and a fascinating story. Well, Cook would set the pattern for British exploration. Two ships led by a captain with surveying experience. So from 1804 to 1844, Britain would send voyages to almost every corner of the globe, intent to expand British influence and to gain scientific knowledge. And among those who followed Cook was Sir John Ross. Ross was an artist, and this is a, a fantastic image of his ship sailing through the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the U.S. at the time was still a very infant nation. It had its own territory, and it had not even explored its own territory. Uh, the U.S. Navy was not organized until 1794. In 1804, you have the creation of Panama and the start of the U.S. Canal as Roosevelt started to build an empire which would require a navy to keep things in line. But in 1812, the Royal Navy had more than 1,800 warships in commission while the U.S. Navy maintained a fleet of only 17 vessels. So you have the Lewis and Clark expedition. That was the first great venture of exploration for the U.S., Lewis and Clark explored and mapped vast areas of a still unexplored, still relatively new nation. One of the primary objectives of the expedition, as directed by President Jefferson, was to observe and record the whereabouts, lives, activities, and cultures of the various American indigenous tribes that inhabited the newly acquired territory and the Northwest in general. Lewis and Clark get far more attention today than they did at the time. 
The journals weren't published until a decade after their expedition. Their amazing botanical collection ended up in England, and the artifacts they brought home were generally scattered around. 1825, U.S. President John Quincy Adams proposed a national observatory, a national university, and a voyage of discovery to explore the Pacific Northwest, but Congress refused to fund any of his proposals. Ironically, it was the half-baked theory of a retired U.S. Army captain, John Clive Sims, that helped push the U.S. into exploration. Sims claimed that land masses at the poles balanced the Earth and that there were holes in the poles through which you could sail down into the center of the Earth to a miraculous land. Maybe he was growing cannabis too, I don't know. And even without the internet, uh, Sims promoted this wacky theory in writing and in speaking. And when you add into that a campaign by New England maritime communities urging Congress to send a maritime expedition to the South Pacific, by the way, stimulating shipbuilding in said New England maritime communities, when you put all that into the mix, what resulted is the U.S. exploring expedition. And the fascinating story of this, and this is another great read if you like this kind of thing, is Nath Nathaniel Philbrick's uh, Sea of Glory, which tells all about this expedition. So the U.S. Navy sent out a fleet of ships to explore, getting all the way down into Antarctica. Between 1840 and 1860, the U.S. would spend between one-fourth and one-third of the national budget financing expeditions and scientific publications. The federal government would publish 60 works about Western exploration and subsidize 15 naval, naval expeditions around the world. And all of this really led to the creation of the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian ins institutions. 1825, a bequest of what today would be about $11 million dollars was given by an English scientist for the purpose of establishing an institution dedicated to advancing knowledge and science to be named after his uncle from whom he had inherited his fortune. The uncle's name was, the uncle's name was Smithson. So with the additional support and funding, today the Smithsonian has 19 museums, nine research centers, and a zoo. One of those research centers is located on Barro, Colorado, an island right in the center of the Panama Canal. We will sail right by it, and I will point it out as we sail by. And it's a very special island. It's untouched. Scientists come from all over the world to study there, and, and it's an amazing thing. But all of that creation of the Smithsonian and everything that follows really goes all the way back to, to Cook, and Cook was the one who started this whole thing. So we continue to explore our planet, and uh, we even now, as we are recruiting and training folks who will make the three-year commitment to travel to Mars. And all of this really begins with this guy, James Cook, who says, I intend to go not only farther than any man has before me, but as far as I think it is possible for a man to go. So I wanted to take just a moment, thank you for all the nice uh, comments you've made to me personally. Uh, people always say these nice things and, and I always say, well, I hope you share it with Princess. And I do, because uh, you know, I've been doing this with Princess for seven years. I've never had any feedback from Princess. They've never said, people like what you're doing, you're doing a good job. They've never said, people think it sucks. Uh, you know, they've never said anything. Never said, well, you, you know, you could do this better, nothing. So uh, I got to assume that someone gets some feedback, but maybe not. So, and it's not just me. It's the whole lecture, retirement, enrichment program on board the ships. Uh, tr you know, this is a very competitive industry. And if a cruise line doesn't think something is important to you as a customer, guess what? It's dropped, okay? 
So with your onboard comments, your You Made a Difference card, when the, you get the email questionnaire that you get when you go home, you need to tell princes what you think and you need to tell them what you like. And uh, they want to give you the best product, but it's really up to you as the consumer to define what that product is. And uh, so I, I hope you'll do that, but I do appreciate your thoughts and your comments, and thank you very much for that. I have fun doing this. It's a great retirement, and uh, I, I like doing it. So coming up, I'll be talking about uh, the second parts of Chile that we're going to be visiting. So enjoy your day uh, today on the beautiful Ocean Princess. Its days are numbered, unfortunately, but uh, we will enjoy it while it's here. Thank you very much.